today. First, we pray today for St. Paul's United Church in Loring, a tiny community, and our Canadian shield. After church, we have some refreshments and conversation, and not just any kind of refreshment. We've got soup and bread and a sweet dessert and conversation. Bible study on Tuesday and the Zoom link is in your email. And please uh, invite a friend with you for that. And in the afternoon, we've got Stitch Corner again. And I need to tell you that Stitch Corner is a critical ministry of this church. Uh, here's a prayer square. Uh, this past week, Allison needed to be in hospital and is at home resting now. But she spent her days uh, holding on to her prayer square. Critically, critically important. The stitches that you stitch. Council is on Tuesday night, and if you have not submitted your reports, I am looking at Charlotte, and Charlotte is looking at me, and she is wondering where your report might be. It's hybrid, by the way, so if you want to come to the church for that, for that meeting, you can do that, as well as being online. Thursday is Bread and Rose's Food Bank, and we're still collecting salt and pepper shakers with the, with the salt and pepper in them, uh, canned potatoes, and vegetables. On November 24th, if you haven't signed up, I think you can still do so. Uh, there is a car load going from here, and it is to Villa Loyola, and it is a, a retreat, and it is a United Church retreat of folks just like you, just like me, getting together and connecting and talking about what it means to be a witness. What it means to be a witness. So it should be very rich. So consider that. Consider that. Two to five, Sunday at Villa Loyola. Ah, Supper Church, back on the 28th of November at 5.30. And then, of course, uh, the tree lighting, 
for this community is on November 30th, so put that in your calendars. Uh, carolers will be needed by 5 o'clock, so if you're interested in doing that, please consider. And finally, we've got some United Church calendars still celebrating our 100th anniversary of the United Church. So you can, uh, you can put a $10 donation in the offering plate if you're planning on, on taking one. Great stuff, so just saying. We gather for worship on land where indigenous people have lived for thousands of years. This church is located on the traditional territory of the Wanapakaving Anishinaabek. We lament the damage that European colonization has had on First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. And we acknowledge that many indigenous people still today live with intergenerational trauma, racism, and inequity. All who live in this area are parties to the Robinson-Huron Treaty, which outlines the shared rights and responsibilities connected to the care and use of the land. As a covenant people, we are called to honor promises. As a church, we have been called to a journey of learning, reconciliation, and reparation. As Christ's people, we are called to love our neighbors. May God support and bless our commitment to live out these calls. In the shadows of life, Jesus proclaims himself our guiding light. No matter where we are, or what circumstances we find ourselves in, Jesus is with us. We light this candle to remind us of the light that never goes out. All are welcome in this place. All are welcome in God's face. Young and old and in between, short and tall, large and lean. Those who are lonely, tired and hurting, or giggling, smiling, or practically bursting. Each as we are. Wonderfully made. We join in God's house together today.
let's pray. Holy One, Mother and Father to us all, gather us under your wings as a hen gathers her chicks. Give us sanctuary from the world that shapes us in ways that are not life-giving. When we are tempted and follow the ways of the world, forgive us. <coughs> we don't trust your voice. So reassure us. When we fail to notice the signs of your spirit, <coughs> open our spirit. We are blessed to be your children. <coughs> Help us be a helping blessing to you and to your dream for all creation. Amen. <coughs> We're changing up the order of service just so slightly today, and we're going to hear our, uh, first of all, we're going to offer, we're going to ask for our time of Thanksgiving. Uh, does anyone have any shout outs for generosity today? I'm just thankful that Allison's on the road to recovery. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I'm thankful for soup today. <laughs> And cake for dessert. <laughs> yes, thank you, Laura and Shay. I'm thankful for being here. Yeah. I'm thankful to be here too. <laughs> That's great. Yes, um, and I am uh, specifically thankful today for Reverend uh, Donna Ross, uh, Donna Scott. She is uh, here and is our special guest speaker today. And we're going to hear more about uh, a really uh, incredibly important place called Cedar Place. And we're going to hear more about that in, uh, in a little while. Um, I'm also grateful that it is Children's Sunday. That is, uh, we are grateful for uh, children of all ages, uh, including uh, all children of God, uh, <laughs> you and me both. And uh, that is uh, celebrated across all denominations. 
So we'll hear our, our story of generosity. This is a story from Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, severe drought and food shortages continue to take a toll on communities. But the Zimbabwe Council of Churches is leading efforts to provide support in partnership with Mission and Service and the Canadian Food Grains Bank. The Scaling Up Resilience Project focuses on practical, long-term solutions. By emphasizing climate-smart farming, gender equality, and community-driven initiatives, the project is helping families strengthen their resilience and work towards a more secure future. The challenges facing Zimbabwe are immense, with frequent droughts, unpredictable rains, tropical cyclones, economic instability, and outbreaks of diseases like cholera, all contributing to severe food insecurity. In the Bikita and Gutu districts, up to 60% of people are affected with many families struggling to put food on the table, send their children to school, and are at risk of gender-based violence. Crop failures, especially due to El Nino, have worsened conditions, leaving communities in urgent need of solutions. The Scaling Up Resilience Program addresses these issues by building on the success of previous humanitarian efforts. It will provide training in gender-sensitive, climate-smart agriculture, strengthen disaster risk, disaster risk management systems, and revive essential community assets such as water conservation works and irrigation schemes. By promoting gender equality, supporting financial resilience through savings and loans programs, and ensuring that all community members, including the elderly and those with disabilities, are included, the project is creating a brighter future for thousands of people. Your gifts have provided crucial support to partners like the Zimbabwe Council of Churches as they work towards a secure and sustainable future. Your continued support is deeply appreciated. We are invited to take part in God's great enterprise of healing the earth, of caring for those who are vulnerable, of building up Christian community. Our offering this day is joined together with God's great enterprise of love. May these gifts of love be multiplied as we conceive of God's abundant love and give birth to the ways of love and justice in our world. Amen.
open to these words from Scripture. Reading is from Ruth, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman, Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, all that you say, I will do. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. For this reading from scripture, thanks be to God, and by God's grace we hear a living word in it. Amen. Yes, things look a little different today. Um, we're going to have time for all ages uh, right here, so you can stay in your seats today. Don't all rush up to the front at once. <laughs> so two weeks ago, we introduced the story of Ruth. Do you remember where we left off in that story? Ruth said she was going to stay with Naomi. Yes. That's right. Ruth was going to stay with Naomi. Did she just stay with her? What was that word that she used? She didn't just stay with her, she... Traveled with her. Clung she to clung her. to her. She clung to her. Yeah. Uh, where were they leaving? Where did Naomi and her... They were headed to Jerusalem, back. They were headed back to Naomi's village, but... Yes, Moabites. Moabites, that's right, yes. Naomi was a Moabite, and so was Orpah, her sister, or her <coughs> sister-in-law. Remember that Naomi had gone to Moab with her husband, initially, because there was no bread left in Jerusalem. Interestingly, because um, the word Jerusalem means, no, sorry, Bethlehem. Bethlehem means bread, and that's where they came from. I'm getting my stories mixed up in my town. I'm getting my geography mixed up. Naomi was headed back to Bethlehem. What happened in, in Moab for Naomi to return? What happened? Her husband died. Yes, her husband died. Anything else happened? Her sons died. Her sons died too. So Naomi came back, and who came back with her? Ruth. Ruth. Ruth did. And who went back home? Orpah. Orpah went back home. Yeah. Ruth was Naomi's helper. Despite her own hardship and loneliness from leaving her country and her family, she would help her mother-in-law. Now the story unfolds today. Naomi's in Naomi's village with a man named who? Do we catch his name? Boaz. A man named Boaz, who helped the two women by letting them take food from the corners of their field of his fields. 
Why not the middle of the fields? What was, what was going on in the corners of the fields? Right. Thank you, Deb. It was the garbage. That's right. Yeah, that was the, the leftovers, the scraps. But Boaz said, please, take this food. They were hungry. It just so happened that Boaz was a close relative to Naomi. Why was this important that Naomi had a close male relative? Anybody remember what, what it was like for women? They had to have a man to be protected and to take care of them. Right. Yeah. Women completely yeah. powerless. Yeah. That's why it was so important. Boaz became the helper in this story as well. Becoming Ruth's husband and wife. And they had a, a child named Obed. Yes. These helpers in this story. Stories of helping others. Today in Pastor Pam's bag, did you think I forgot? <laughs> is a new book, a new book that I got. It's beautiful, and it's called The Book of Belonging. Bible stories for kind and contemplative kids. And I think it says, it's dot, dot, dot after that, kids like us, <laughs> right? Kids like us. And in it is a story of Ruth, and there's a, a moment in here where there's a wondering. So I'm going to read this wondering time, and then I'm just going to ask you a question or two. Just some wondering questions. On nights when the winds howl and the worries coil around our bellies, the world can feel large and lonesome, dark and dangerous, and sometimes it can be hard to understand why. Look for the helpers, the wise ones tell us. There are always people of peace, power, and protection. They reflect God's light into dark places and help us to remember. The story of Ruth sits in the Bible in the middle of so many stories of darkness. Just read the book of Judges. It is as if God is reminding us too, look for those helpers. Be the helpers. In Naomi and Ruth's world, women without husbands or sons were in danger, no matter how brave or resourceful they were. So God told God's people to take special care to take care of the other groups that were lacking belonging. Boaz prayed for Ruth, and that was very good. But she remembered him and us, and reminds us that God is inviting us to be helpers too. We get to join with God in blessing the whole world. So let's think about our community. Who needs help reaching belonging? Who isn't feeling like they belong right now in this community? People that don't have homes. Maybe people of color. Yeah. Young people. People new to the country who just haven't been able to make connections yet, don't have resources. Addicts. Hmm. Anyone in 
this congregation? Maybe not feeling like they belong? Maybe everybody does at some point. <laughs> yeah. Truth. Truth. That's one of the good things about this congregation. You feel like you belong. I love that. I love that too, Judy. But it's a question and a wondering that we should ask each other regularly. Today we're going to hear another story. A story about a special place in nearby Sudbury where women and their children can go if they need to feel safe. Safe and secure. Reverend Donna Scott will share why it is so important to be a community helper. Right now, let's, let's do what we do well. And if we're not close to each other, let's reach out and pretend that we're holding each other's hands, and we'll say our Lord's Prayer together. Creator God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. There were 278 homeless in Sudbury. 
209 were what we call chronic homeless. And then in October, we had 301 homeless with 230 chronic homeless. And when we talk about chronic homelessness, we're saying that these people have been on the street for at least one month. So this is their second or third or fourth month. So you see the chronic, how it's grown over the time? Started at 88 or 68, 79, and now we're up to 230 chronic homeless. Those were the figures we had at the beginning of the month. Keep those in mind. So between September and October, we gained thir uh, 33 more homeless, and 21 of them were chronic homeless. So, something happened in October, October the 8th. You might have seen this, October the 8th, was called Point in Time. And across Canada, well, the Canadian government uh, wanted everyone who was homeless to be interviewed and documented. So the staff in the various shelters, along with all the client navigators in, in, in the country, went out on the street October the 8th and interviewed and documented everybody homeless. And the results, you saw it in the Sudbury Star, published October the 11th. City measures homelessness population at 500. What was it the figures I had? 301. It's gone to 500. And his remarks, figures tell us there's more, much more work to be done. That's what the mayor tells us. So we're up 25% homeless since 2021. Now here's something else. In Ontario, they found at, on October 8th, there was 234,000. How many did I say were across Canada? 235. Ontario has 234. Does that mean there's just a thousand across the rest of Canada? No, I got a phone, an email, just as I was leaving work on Thursday, because I'm off Friday, and the email told us they were still counting across Canada, but they were already at 500,000. So we've met 2030 goals, the goals of 2030, in 2024. Can you imagine what it's going to be like in 2030 now? How many are going to be on the street? So we don't know what the projected totals are going to be in, and we'll probably get the figures. And then here, there's an encampment down off Brady Street. People living. Not very nice. So when we talk about homelessness, there's four different kinds. Now, some people prefer to be, have it called on being unhoused. They take offense when we call them homeless. They're unhoused, they say, because they say we make a home wherever we are, whether we're in a building or not. So we're unhoused. But when we talk about this, we're talking about four different categories. So we have the first one, the in, that's encampment. So these figures will have gone up. I have for 301, we've got 200 that I haven't accounted for. So when I did this, there was 78 in, encamp in encampments, which means they're living in tents, they're on property that doesn't belong to them, and they can be groups, they can be single. And then we have provisional shelter, 51 of the 301 were in provisional shelters. And when we talk about that, we're talking about being in the hospital or they're sofa surfing. You've ever heard of that term, sofa surfing? Or they're living 
in corrections or in jail, or they're in uh, some kind of um, post uh, corrections provision, like a halfway house. And then we have some that are in the treatment programs at Monarch and such. And then, then we have unsheltered here. 73 were unsheltered of the 301. So they're living in a public or a private place without consent, in a doorway, under a bush, down by a store, over a vent. There's a, a vent on Elgin Street, just past Elm. And I would go to work and I see a tent built over this, this hot air vent. They stay there to keep warm. And then, um, fourth thing is we have the sheltered. And those are people that are in the off the street program. It's on Lark Street, 200 Lark Street. And what it is, it's a first come first serve basis. So they line up in the evening to get a bed and then they're all out on the street during the day because that place is closed during the day. So we have the off the street, we have our place, uh, Cedar Place. We have Safe Harbor, which is run by the Elizabeth Fry Center. And you may have seen they bought a second building on Cedar Street down by Brady. Um, so they're going to expand. And then we have the YWC, YWCA Ginevra House, where people can live over on St. Raphael. So there are many reasons that they're living on the street. Every, anything from abuse, or they've been discharged from treatment with nowhere to go, they've been evicted, we have had calls from people who are sitting on the curb because the landlord has evicted them. No place to go. Sometimes it's because of uh, relational breakdowns. Um, the husband has been abusive or, or the part, one of the partners has. Sometimes it's financial. Uh, the working poor. Sometimes it's loss or their housing is unsafe. Sometimes there's mental health or trauma that they've experienced. Sometimes they're a new arrival or a new immigrant. They have no place to go. We have had them come up from Toronto in an Uber and land on our front door saying, have you got a place for us to live? Yes. Sometimes it's a disability. And then we have the refugee claims where they come to this country and once they get here, they claim refugee status so that they can stay in the country. Sometimes it's substance abuse or on drugs. Sometimes it's just plain unemployment. The unemployment insurance check doesn't cover it all. So there are many reasons. So let me tell you about the Salvation Army. As you know, the Salvation Army was founded by William Booth back in 1865. He was a Methodist pastor, and he got very perturbed that people were coming to church and singing, I love you, Lord, then they were going home. He talked about 1 John 4, and it says this, we love him because he first loved us. If anyone says, whoops, I just lost it. If anyone says, I love God, but loveth not his neighbor, he's a liar. And the truth is not in him. And then it goes on, he has given us this command. If we love God, we must love our brother. And so he was perturbed that this wasn't happening in the church. So he founded the Salvation Army. And what he did is they went out on the streets feeding the poor in East London. Some of you will remember the hats the ladies used to wear with the big bowl on the side, the ribbon. Well, that hat was constructed to protect their heads because people would throw rocks at them and call them names, but they kept going. And so, 1865 this started, and it came 
to Canada in 1882. And it started in London, Ontario. So when, in 1939, we opened the first soup kitchen in Sudbury. Don't know if anybody remembers that. <laughs> Nobody's going to admit it. In 2007, until we opened a crisis shelter for women and families in a local hotel. That's where we started. And then in 2011, by the request of the city of Sudbury, we opened our present shelter, Cedar Place. It's a semi-detached house, but we've got both sides, and we put doors in. So we've got two sets of stairs going up the middle, because it would have been two houses. So yes, that's Cedar Place now. And since, okay, next. Since January this year, you will see we have served 117 people. In 2018 total, we served 287. And of course, there's COVID, 180 in service many, but it's come down. And the reason is people are staying longer because they can't find a place to, to live. So the average length of stay um, in 2018, it was 16 days, two weeks, not bad. But now it's 72.89 days that they're staying. In fact, we have two ladies. One has been there just over a year looking for a place. Another one's been there around nine months. You see, there are fewer places to rent now, and not only that, the landlord gets the pick of the litter. We have so many people coming to the house so he can pick. And then rents have gone sky high, and they don't have the funds to, uh, to carry them. They can't pay for the rent, they can't pay for the hydro and the food, let alone get a new piece of clothing or a piece of furniture. And that's what we call the working poor. They're working, but they're not getting anywhere. Okay, next. So while we help these people, we also have to turn people away. This is 2023. You see up here? We turned away a total of 1,561. Next. Here is 2024. As of October the 31st, we had turned away 1,694. So we're well over 100 from last year, over, and we aren't even to the end of the year. We have people that phone every day saying, have you got a bed yet? Have you got a bed yet? And we don't. We just say we'll have to phone back tomorrow. We don't know. So our bed occupancy rate in 2018 was 75%. Now it's 100.33%. So right now we are supposed to have 16 in the house. We have a place for 16 people. Right now we have um, 23. We're supposed to have a placement at the hotels for 12. For a while there, we were running 23, and then we were up to 42, so we were running 19 at the hotels. Right now, we have 23 in the house, and we have, I think, about six at the hotel. So we're running 29, we're still over. So you can imagine we have a dining room, it seats 16, but if there are 23 there for supper, it gets a little crowded in the place. And we have them from all different ethnic groups. They come from every country. 
They come from every faith in there. So Cedar Place, it's open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So somebody's working Christmas. We have three programs. We have women in the shelter. We have mothers with small children in the shelter. We take the children up to, I think, 13 in the house. So we've had the newborn coming from the hospital. So we have all the toys and, and the, the gizmos and the rocking chair and everything to help the mothers. And then we have the families and men, and men who have custody in our hotel program. So if there's a man involved, they live at the hotel. So yes, we're supposed to have 28 beds. Right now we're sitting at 29. We have two staff on each ship for safety and security. And you'll notice here, I don't know if you, can you see this on my, okay, when I'm in Cedar Place and I find there's a brawl going on or I'm in danger, I just push the button and the police are there. So we give security to all our staff all the time. So while, next slide, while these people are in our care, they, they have a place to sleep. They are fed three meals a day and two snacks. Now, what was your grocery bill <coughs> when you went for weeks? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ours is, uh, the one I saw from the food bank was over $600, and Ashley had to go and buy things that we didn't get in the food bank. So you can imagine, we're looking at seven to $750 a week for these people. We don't just feed the girls in the house. At the end, they cook enough and they put the rest that's left over into microwave dishes and those go to the people in the hotel. So they just have to warm up their meals. So we're feeding everybody. So they get this and, and we have a, a gate on the kitchen and it's opened at meal time and for the two snacks each day. And then we have my Sally Ann spot or my sister's place where we take them where they can get clothes. Some of them have come to us with just what they have on their back. They've had to escape. And so when they come to us, one of the first things we do is do an assessment. We need to know what do they need and we call it an intake. So we need to know what they need, what's the care level, are they going to need a doctor, are they going to need mental health supervision and help. We then refer them. Some of them need to have their teeth looked after. Some of them need glasses, Some just because they've been on the street. So this is what the intake does. And then we begin to refer them to what they need. We have people in town who help them and they take the government's payment. They don't charge over, they take what the government pays. And then we have to help them because they can't get an apartment until all their paperwork's in order. Some of them have been on the street for five years so they haven't filed income tax in all that time. It has to be brought up to date some of them don't have a birth certificate. They've lost it. Some of them don't have a social insurance card anymore. They've been on the street. So all of these things have to be in order. So we work very closely with the, a member of parliament for the federal as well as the MPP to help expedite these things so they can be ready to, um, to move. And so every day, the, the um, girls in the office search for apartments. And then they pull the list off and give it to the girls to start phoning. And then they assist them to look for an apartment. And then they also help them with budgeting. Some of them have no idea what they can afford. So the staff, one of the girls is really good 
up with this. She sits down with them, shows them how much money they've got coming in and what they're going to be able to afford. They have no idea. They've been on the street. They don't realize how the rents have gone up. So that they do this budgeting so that they get the confidence to look for houses or apartments or rooms to live in and they know what they can afford. Next. So once they have their new home, we help them get things to make it go. We have a, we call it the Sally Ann Boutique downstairs. People have given us uh, towels and sheets and stuff like that. People also give us clothing and shoe, uh, shoes and boots and uh, winter coats and come to the front door and say, here. So do you know what happens as soon as the clothing comes in? Goes in the bug zapper right away. So everything that comes in goes through the bug zapper. It's a great thing. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, <I> got one. <laughs> so anyway, we provide them with these clothing as much as we can give them. So when you're thinking of changing the colors in your bathroom or you need new dishes or you want to change the colors in your bedroom, think of us. We can use the stuff that you don't want around anymore. And then we have the Baskets of Hope. The Rotary Club puts together a clothes basket and it has everything in it you could imagine. It has coffee and the fixings or it has toilet paper and band-aids and a shower curtain and oven mitts. Everything they need to get started in their apartment is in this clothes basket. <coughs> Even laundry detergent, some bounce sheets, everything just to get them started. The United Way helps the Salvation Army too for groceries. <coughs> and so they, they, um, they can get groceries at food banks. And then we have, uh, we refer them to Better Beginnings, Better Futures. St. Vincent de Paul helps them get their furniture, provides furniture to get started. And Sister Marie, this is a little old nun on the streets of Sudbury. I remember the first time I heard about her. I, I was training when I was with Corrections Canada as a chaplain, and Brad Hale was training me, and, and he said, oh, we're going across the street. I see Sister Marie coming down the street with curtains. She'll have me hanging them. <laughs> so she is just one of those people that does everything to get them started in their new apartments. Um, they are also, uh, Ontario Works provides them with a mattress yes. and a bug cover, a bed bug cover to protect the mattresses as they move into their, their new homes. And then we have food banks around the city and we refer them to the food bank that's closest to them. Uh, there's one on Lorne, and there's one on Elm, one down on Notre Dame, the Salvation Army one. The, yes, there's one out here. There's yeah. one on the Donovan, mm -hmm. and then there's one out in Gary Street in Sudbury, and I know you have one out here, but we refer them wherever they're living, mm -hmm. whatever area they're in, <coughs> they get a referral to that food bank so that they um, can, can live. So, we at Cedar Place are there to give them hope. That's our motive. We give hope to the ones who have become hopeless. But what do we need? We need your prayer. You know, it's, it's like being on the front lines. I remember a story many years ago of a missionary who went off with his wife to Africa. And um, while he was there, they had children. His wife died, his children died, and he came home broken, very broken. And, and they said, why? He said, you know what? You, as a church, promised to hold the ropes while I went down in 
to the sin and iniquity that was going on. These are the words he used. He said, but somewhere, somewhere along the line, somebody didn't hold the ropes. And that's what prayer does for our staff. You hold the ropes. Just this week, we had two in a terrible fight in the kitchen. The staff have intervened. The staff put their lives in danger to take care of these ladies. We need people to pray because it's only God that can help in some situations. And we need your support. And how you can give us support first through your prayers because they need to know that Jesus loves them. And then the support in things like our, our um, fundraisers. We have the Bounce for Hope on the long weekend in August during the, the uh, what is it, the uh, Poutine Festival. And um, we make, we try to make money there. People donate stuff. And uh, we try to do that. And then the second one is coming up. And you've got the, the notice back there. The Santa Shuffle. And if he, there's a phone number um, on the thing, I think, or a, an email, Ashley, and she can give you the particulars. We're getting ready to do it. We've mapped out the route and everything. So if you can't run for five kilometers, there's a one kilometer shuffle where we can walk around. <laughs> and we raise some money there. So, yes. Yeah. Some people come with their, uh, their, you know, walkers, and away they go, and raise the money, and this is what helps us. So the scripture says, remember Jesus said, remember when he, he said, the they, disciples said, well, Lord, when did we do all of these things? And he said, when you did it to the least of these, the prisoners, the homeless, you did it to me. So we don't just do it for these people. We do it because we love Jesus and because he's told us to love them. And that's why we do it. Oh, and one last thing. This Saturday, Cedar Place is going to be in the parade. Watch for it. <laughs> And yes, we've got a salvation, we put together a band, a Salvation Army type band, and we're doing the nativity scene. I've been so crazy. <laughs> but uh, yes, we're going to have, be in the parade. The title this year is Lights and Sounds. Our praise says the light has come. Because Jesus has come. The light is here. Any questions? Yes, so if you wanted to donate money, yes, um, are you through uh, Canada Helps? No, we have our own, um, we have our own um, a registration number. Okay. You can give directly to us. Um, yeah, Cedar Place, yes, okay. we're fully able to do that. And, and a number of people do. One church, I was out speaking at the end, they, we're talking about what they were going to do in October. They're going to have a potluck in October and one in November, and then they're going to have the Christmas thing. And one lady stood up and said, look, we eat a lot. So why don't we take the money that we were going to use to make the dish for our potluck and donate it? And they did. And there was over $600. Can you imagine all those groceries came to us and helped pay? It paid almost a week's groceries with the help. So, and they each got receipts. Um, Barb writes them out herself. Thank you so very much. Thank you. <coughs> My pleasure. Yeah. While we're, uh, uh, that was incredible information to know. Uh, these places have been in this community, in this greater Sudbury community, for years and years and years, and you may not have known any of them. Um, so we are so grateful that, uh, that we've been educated. So 
Thank you, Reverend Donna. We're going to have a time of a, a prayer, prayers for the people. Now, however, while we're preparing our hearts for that time, uh, I'm going to go to the back and uh, Denelda's here today. And we've been told that Demara is in the hospital. And we're, uh, we're wanting to pray. We want to pray uh, over you and for you. Um, while Faye plays some music, if anyone wants to come lay hands on Danelda, uh, the family is, um, I'm worried and concerned.
God's blessing. Oh God, you know our hearts. We sing.
God reminds us to be the helpers. Our life is ours to share with others. Trinity, as we leave this place, may our sharing be a blessing to all who receive it.